In today's episode, we're looking back at the action from Sunday, including some blowouts and a terrible knee injury to Jonathan Isaac. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode also brought to you by RockAuto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Well, we're here Sunday's games. We're going to preview Monday's games as well. Uh, Some really interesting performances. Some big wins in determining the uh, play-in games in the Western Conference in particular. Uh, and of course, one big injury that we do have to uh, have to talk about. Let's get into talking about those games now. The first one of these games that we are going to take a look at was the first game of the day. It was the Wizards going down to the Brooklyn Nets. Finally, we got the Tom Bryant we've been hoping for. 37 minutes for the big tank. 30 points, 13 rebounds. He hit four triples. He had two blocks. The hand breaks have been taken off, finally. It's great to see. Let's hope we can get more of this and at least the Wizards can keep their games competitive because this is the Bryant we expected at the beginning of the season. Rui Hachimura, who played well last game, not so much here, but in an encouraging thing, he did have some other numbers. Four rebounds, four assists, and a steal and a block, but only nine points, while Troy Brown had one of the best games of his career. 22, 10, and 8. High usage for Brown, got the assists as well. He's in with a real big opportunity here. It was also pretty big minutes from Jerome Robinson again. Now, he couldn't get it going like last game because he was never going to be able to, but 12 points in 28 minutes, then it's the 28 minutes that are the most encouraging there. Well, Isaac Bonga struggled, as did Shabazz Napier. He was outplayed Napier by Ishmael Smith once again, who had 14, 4, and 5 with two blocks, and he's putting up some pretty strong numbers here in the Orlando bubble. For the Nets, they did make a change to their starting lineup. Tyler Johnson started over Chris Chiozza. I still have no idea why Lance Thomas is starting. He only played the 10 minutes. Johnson struggled 2, 6, and 5 and missed all seven of his shots. But again, we talk about we got the Thomas Bryant we hoped for. We got the Jarrett Allen we hoped for as well. 38 minutes, 22 and 15 with a steal and a block. Hit all 10 of his free throws. Maybe there's some sell high ability here because I just don't know what they're going to do when DeAndre Jordan's back next season. But this is what Allen can be. It was also great from Smoke and Joe Harris, 27 and 7 with six triples. And Levert was big again, 34 and 7. But efficiency is always going to be the problem. 55% efficiency on 33 usage, poor free throws, just 44% from the field. That's what's always going to hold him back. Lawawu Cabro couldn't keep it going, and Rowdy Rodion's Kuroks struggled a little bit as well, just the two points for Kuroks, while Chiozza played better off the bench than Johnson, 14-2-6, and and I think he's probably a better source of assist than what Tyler is, but that role looks like it's going to be sort of up and down as, uh, as the season continues. Next up, it was Portland against Boston. This is massive for not for Boston to get the win, but more importantly for Portland to lose, or it's bad for Portland to lose and important for the other teams around them that they did uh, get rolled here in the end by Boston. But 124-128, Lillard was great again. 30 with 16 assists, while McCollum had 17, 8, and 4. But let's talk about the big fella, Yusuf Nurkic. 32 minutes for Nurk. 30 and 9, a block, two steals. Whiteside is a complete non factor, just 16 minutes for Whiteside. Nurkic is the best center on this team. He's the second best player on this team, and he looks right back to where he was before. Absolutely stunning uh, stuff from Nurkic so far. Carmelo Anthony, uh, good game last time. Not so much here. 13 points on 36% shooting. Very little else. It's all going to come down to how efficient he can be with these other numbers being pretty lacking. And that's just going to be the problem with Mallow. And it's been the problem all season. So I don't want to see you know, the, the apology needs to be as loud as the disrespect. Well, can the disrespect be then as loud as the apology? Because he wasn't very good in this game. And that's what's going to happen with Mallow. But Gaz Trent... No, scary! 21 points for Gaza. He hit seven triples. He did have a steal and a block, now only one rebound and one assist. It also falls a little bit into that. If, if the scoring's not there and the shooting's not there, I'm not wanting, to, I'm not going to be able to rely upon his other numbers. But he was great. Anthony Simons not in the rotation again as they're going with a really tight eight-man rotation. For the Celtics, Tatum, who was poor in the first game, was great here. 34, 4, and 8 with two steals and a block. Hayward had 22 and Jalen Brown. 16 points in the fourth quarter, 30 points overall, six triples. He was fantastic in that shooting. I don't think he missed a shot in the last quarter. 
Kemba, still working his way back, but 14 points and only six shots in 22 minutes. I reckon it's going to be a few more games before we see him fully ramped up, and it might not be until the playoffs, but he was super strong here. While Marcus Smart stuffed the stat sheet, apart from scoring three points there, five rebounds, four assists, three steals, and two blocks for Smart as Boston gets the big win there over Portland. Again, more of a, more of a big loss than a big win. Speaking of big wins, this one was San Antonio over Memphis. The Spurs, they're 2-0. Are they going to push into the play-in game? DeJounte Murray, 21-10, while Maximum Derek White. Maximum Derek. Didn't shoot that well, but had 16-6-7. And, and those guys playing together, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that it would work. And it's working fine. Lonnie Walker, much like Gary Trent, I worry that if the shot doesn't fall, he does nothing else. And that's what happened here. 12 points in 25 minutes on 12 shots. And Keldon Johnson continues to impress, but not really from a box score perspective. Nine and six in 25 minutes for Keldon. Paddy Mills made his debut. I don't expect Mills to play every game here. While Jakob Pertl fouled out. Only played 21 minutes, six and seven with two blocks. Continues to put up good fantasy numbers, but the fouling was obviously a concern there. For Memphis, Triple J, 35 minutes. He played big minutes in the first game. 21 points, two steals, two blocks. The rebounding looks to be, it's still atrocious, but the fact that he's getting through these games without foul trouble is massive. And Ja Morant had 25, 9, and 9. And Grayson Allen taking minutes away from the wave pool. D'Anthony Melton. Allen had 15 in 28 minutes. He looked pretty good out there. Valanchunas, uh, had some foul issues early in this one. 13 and 11 for him. While Dylan Brooks, man, his shooting is rough. 16 points, nothing else. And if the shot doesn't fall, he just he takes too many shots for a guy that's not as good as he thinks he is. I think that they need to upgrade that position at some point in the future. I'd be trying to cash out on Dylan Brooks in Dynasty. I, I just don't believe in him as a long-term option. While Brandon Clark wasn't his usual self, just the eight and three in 25 minutes there for Clarky. Guys, it's a stressful time for everybody. COVID-19 right across the uh, right across the, the world. All right, let's move on now to the next game of the day. A real blowout here, the Sacramento Kings and the Orlando Magic. The Magic win 132-116. We'll talk about Magic in a second, but this game was over really early. So we only got 25 minutes from De'Aaron Fox, 24 minutes from Rashawn Holmes. It did enable Harry Giles to put up a massive game, 23-8 and in 20 minutes on just 11 shots. Now, he was really poor in the first game, but that extra opportunity was great here. While both Bogdan Bogdanovich and Buddy Heald struggled with their shot, Heald has been very, very bad in these two games so far. 12 points on 13 shots for Heald. I worry about what's actually going on with him at this point. He is struggling, and I don't really see him in Sacramento long term. It's not There's not much to really talk about this Kings team, given how much of a blowout this game was. All the focus, though, is in Orlando, because Jonathan Isaac suffered an injury, which at the time of recording, it appears to be an ACL injury to that same knee that he was recovering from. Uh, we hope that it's not an ACL. It doesn't look great at this point, and that's going to put the 2021 2020-2021 season for Isaac, at least the beginning of that season, on hold, and that's terrible news. With Isaac going down, you're going to see more Gary Clark, more James Ennis, and more Michael Carter-Williams, who was great here, Carter-Williams. 12-5-3 and three with three steals and two blocks. Vooch had 23 in 23 minutes, and Gordon had 22 in 24 minutes, while Terrence Ross got really hot off the bench. But this was a destruction from the, the moment this game began, and that's why minute totals were down. Markel Fultz only played the 20 minutes off the bench. I thought he looked okay out there. He's going to get more playing time as they ramp up, but that Isaac injury is a real dampener from this Magic team who you know, put up together a really, really huge win. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, it looks like Johnny's going to be out for a considerable amount of time. All right, on to the next game. It is the Milwaukee Bucks. They go down to the Rockets, 120-116 in the end. Giannis had 36 and 18, but you couldn't really get it done at the end, which is disappointing for him. And there's a lot of critics coming out for Giannis at the moment on Twitter. I'm not buying into that. He's still awesome, but a few critics coming out for him at this point. Brooke Lopez also feasted on the small ball Rockets with 23 and 12, and Middleton had 27 and 12. Remember, the Bucks were going into this one without Eric Bledsoe and Pat Connaughton. Dante DiVincenzo, the big ragu, he started. He did struggle in that role. He only played the 23 minutes. George Hill played 27 minutes to sort of mop up, as DiVincenzo was you know, wild with his turnovers in this game. Marvin Williams also got a big 23 minutes after not playing in the first game. Uh, so a little bit of a different rotation. Robin Lopez barely playing against this small ball Rockets team. 
For Houston, Jimmy Harden had some early foul troubles, four in the first half, but ended with 24, 7, and 7, and six steals, while Westbrook had 31, 6, and 8, and Covington again with the defense. 15 and 7, three triples and three steals. It's just more of the same from the Rockets. Big minutes, small rotation, 30 more minutes for Dan House for another four threes and 16 points. That's what he is, a points and threes and steals sort of guy. Jeff Green did a decent job. Benny McLemore you know, got some points early, ended with nine. So really just a tight rotation, as we expect from the Rockets. And they've had two huge wins. Beat the Mavericks and then beat the Bucks in this one. So that's great for them and the small ball experiment as to the direction that it's going at the moment. All right, let's move on to the last game of the day. A, a real tight one here in the end. Two tight ones to finish off the day. The Dallas Mavericks go down to the Phoenix Suns. Uh, bit of a bit of an upset there as Phoenix get to the victory, and they've been good in their first two games here. One seventeen, one fifteen for the uh, for the Suns as they beat the beat the Mavericks there. Um, from the Dallas side of things, Luka Doncic, way too many minutes for Doncic, 38 minutes, but he had 48 and 11. They're not really going anywhere in, in terms of seeding, so it doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's great to see Porzingis Porzingis put up some good numbers again. 30 and 8 with four blocks. He's playing well with Doncic. He's getting the usage he needs. He's putting up those huge numbers. That ACL rust is done. Seth Curry struggled in game one with some foul trouble. 35 minutes, 16 points. With him getting that much playing time, Trey Burke, who was remarkable in game one, wasn't able to, to do it again. And this is more realistic. This is a more realistic rotation, those minutes for Curry. D-Lon right in there, not Trey Burke being the best shooter of all time. So we've got 25 D-Lon minutes, 35 Seth Curry minutes. Now, Wright only provided two steals and a block and not much else, but he's still getting those minutes. Whereas Burke just had four points in his 12 minutes, and it was a rough night from Hardaway. One of 12 for two points. He did have 10 rebounds, but still a pretty poor shooting night. For the Suns, Devin Booker fouled out. He had 30 points with four assists, while DeAndre Ayton had foul trouble and only played 21 minutes here, seven and eight. So to get a win with those two guys in foul trouble to varying degrees is massive. Cameron Johnson, 40 minutes for the rookie who started again, 19 and 12 with four triples. And it's great to see him pulling down those boards and not just being a shooter. He's going to get significant run, it looks like, in this bubble. While McCall Bridges did a pretty okay job, I guess, of defending Luka Doncic, who Doncic, let's be honest, should have taken that uh, shot at the end instead of kicking it out. Bridges only had four points, but two steals and three blocks, and that's where the appeal is with him. And 29-7 and seven for Rick Rubio. Sharich coming off the bench, played 22 minutes, while campaign again, looked pretty good as a backup point guard. 10-4 and four in his 20 minutes, and Javon Carter replaced Booker down the stretch and had six points with five assists. So a big win for the Suns that keeps them absolutely with a sliver of a hope of getting into that play-in game, which is not something that I necessarily thought I'd be saying at this point. One thing I did think I'd be saying is that if you're looking for parts for your car, rockauto.com is the place to go. Why go to your local store when you can go straight to rockauto.com? Don't worry about the weight and don't worry about that nonsense two-tier pricing system that these places have, one for the professionals and one for the do-it-yourselfers. rockauto.com, the same price right across the board. So no matter what part it is, whether it's engine control models, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet, rockauto.com has you covered. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Time for us to transition now into DFS for Monday. Take a look at these games coming up for Monday. There are six games on the DraftKings main slate, the Toronto-Miami game is not uh, included in that. We'll just give it a quick overview of that one. Toronto is all healthy. Miami has Bam Adebayo and Goran Dragic listed as probable. Jimmy Butler did miss practice, but he is going to be ready to play. So no concerns there for Butler at this point. We won't go too deep into that game just because, again, we we don't know. Uh, it's not included in that DraftKings main slate, and we're going to be looking at DraftKings for today's show. So the first game we are going to take a look at here is the Indiana Pacers and the Washington Wizards. The Pacers, uh, Malcolm Brogdon is questionable. Savonis is out. While Victor Oladipo is doubtful, it's the first half of a back-to-back. -back, so Oladipo is going to sit this one out most likely and then be ready to play on Tuesday. Washington also is coming in on a back-to-back. -back. This is the second game for them. No news at this point. I reckon there might be a chance. Now, considering Tom Bryant played 37 minutes and he's dealing with a foot injury, there is a chance that he sees minutes limited or he gets rested. That's something to pay attention to. If Brogdon is out, we're going to see Holiday, Holiday, and probably uh, you know, TJ Warren, and probably someone like either Doug McDirt or TJ Leaf jump into the starting lineup. So that would be one to watch in that case. For your point guards, Brogdon is listed at 6,200. 
not massively keen on that, but if there is no Oladipo and Sabonis, he's going to get good usage. I just worry about how much they play him. So he could be a cautious one to have a look at. Ish Smith at 47 is playing pretty well. He's getting you about 30 a night, so that looks to be pretty solid. Well, Aaron Holiday at 5,000 could be a real monster if both Brogdon and Oladipo are out. Now, if Brogdon plays, it does reduce the impact of Holiday, but if he is out, I think that does help quite significantly. Shabazz Napier struggling, and I wouldn't want to spend 57 on him, and, and TJ McConnell, no thanks. For your shooting guards, Justin Holiday's at 37. Really comes down to whether he can add any sort of offense to go with his steals. At this point, he hasn't, but there is some GPP value at such a low price. While if Brogdon's out, Sumner may get into the rotation somewhat. I don't think that that's a super one. Troy Brown's at 52. He dropped a massive 51-pointer today. He's never been that level of player usually, but he still can be a 25 to 28-point guy, and I think that makes him valuable at 5,200. Jerome Robinson is always just a bit of a hit-and-miss guy. Dougie McDirt's at 34, not interested in him at all, while Tony Warren's at 7,400. Of course, he dropped 71 DraftKings points last time out with 53 real-life points. That salary has bumped a lot. That probably means it's a fade situation for him. And then on to the big man, the tank Tom Bryant's at 6,300. Um, that's pretty sexy. I, I worry that he doesn't play, but otherwise the matchup looks okay and I'd be good with him. While Miles Turner at 61, that's a great matchup for Turner. Limited production last game due to foul trouble, so expect him to jump back up uh, and be able to post 30 plus would be my guess. Hachimura's at 58. He's more of a cash guy with, with limited ceiling. And then you've got Wagner and Sampson and TJ Leaf. I think Wagner would be one to look at. Of course, if Bryant doesn't play, he would have to be the starting center, I would imagine. For the Wizards in that scenario... Next up, it is the Denver Nuggets and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Gary Harris. Can't find the button. Nice, Gary! Uh, he is out. Farton Will Barton is out, while Jamal Murray is questionable for Denver. OKC looks pretty healthy. Gildas Alexander's at 6,000. He should be good for 30. I, I really like that price. While Chris Paul's at 77. If this game becomes a blowout, they're just going to reduce Paul's playing time. He played just 27 minutes last game. We're still good, but there is a risk there. While Schroeder only played 22 minutes last game. He's at 6,400. I don't really like the price, but he should be better than that. The Blue Arrow, Eche Homo, Jamal Murray, 7,200. Uh, I'd be a little bit cautious with his hamstring. I'd probably fade away from him. While Monty Morris at 5,000, not a bad option if Murray does sit. For your shooting guards, we're looking really at Lou Dort, Tori Craig, Troy Daniels, and Hamadou Diallo. I'm not interested in any of those, but the Italian cock, Danilo Gallinari. Hands off my cock! He's at 5,600. Probably want to leave him out as well. Michael Porter Jr. at 4,500. Did not impress last game. He started, but didn't do a huge amount. Maybe more of a tournament guy than anything else. Robertson, Ferguson, no thank you. For your bigs, Noel's at 34. I don't like it. I do like Adams at 5,400, though. He should have a really strong floor number. And same as Big Chungus, Nikola Jokic at 9,400. He should be good for 40, 45. One of the best big, uh, big name players on the board. Jeremy Grant, Paul Millsap, Darius Basley, they're not looking super interesting. Millsap at 49, maybe, but I think they'll go pretty easy on him, this old Denver Nuggets team. Next up, we've got the Memphis Grizzlies and the New Orleans Pelicans. The Grizzlies, another team on a back-to-back -back here. The Pelicans are favored by four, and the total is 238.5. Both of these teams battling for that eighth and ninth spot have lost their first two games, so they need to do better here, obviously. Um, we don't know what's happening with Zion Williamson and his minutes, 15 and 14 minutes in the first two games. They claim he's not on a restriction, so that seems like bullshit, but we'll see how that all pans out. For your point guards, Morant's at 7,300. He dropped 48 today. Really love that price tag, although Drew Holiday defensive matchup can be a hard one. As for Holiday at 8,700, price too high, and Lonzo just can't hit anything. He's at 8,000. That's price way too high. No, no interest in that at all. At shooting guard, J.J. Reddick's a tournament sort of a play, while Dylan Brooks at 5,100 also really just a GPP option. Not, a, not much else there. Grayson Allen, each one more. Allen played well today, but I wouldn't want to go back to the well there. At small four, Josh the Hitman Hart, no thank you. Ingram at 8,100 has been off the last two. There's no doubt about that, but I do think for a GPP option, he is worth a look, and that's probably about it. Anderson, no thanks. And then on to your big man, Brandon Clark at 42. I like the cash value in Clark, uh, while Triple J at 6,200. Big minutes for Jaron Jackson recently. He's putting up some pretty strong numbers, but it hasn't been spectacular, especially with a $1,000 price rise. Jackson Hayes, Derek Favors. They're not going to do it for me. Well, Jonas Valanciunas is too high, I believe, at 79, and Zion at 78, way too high. 
Let us move now on to the next game. We've got the Spurs and the Sixers. The Spurs on a back-to-back. The Sixers, seven-point favorites. Marco Ballinelli and Bryn Forbes are both questionable. If Ballinelli plays, I imagine Mills won't play. Are you going to still get big minutes from Murray and White and Walker the majority of this game at point guard? Murray's at 6,200. Looks like a pretty good bet to me. And Maximum Derrick at 57, also really strong. They're both producing in tandem, so I like both guys here. Um... Benny Simmons at 9,100. I also think that's not looking too bad. Bryn Forbes, Hull Neto, Shake Milton, they're not options here. At shooting guard, Lonnie Walker's at 44. Hasn't really lit it up at all. I do think that price is okay. While Josh Richardson at 48, not one that I'm super interested in here for Joshy. Furkan Korkmaz, Matisse Thibel, no. Small forwards, DeMar DeRozan, 8,200. Big price rise for DeRozan. Didn't live up to it today. On a back-to-back, I'd be a little bit more cautious about using him. And Toby Harris at 86. That's too high of a price rise for Harris. So he's in the fade territory for sure. Keldon Johnson could be one to watch if Ballinelli and uh, and if they rest someone like Rudy Gay as well. Keldon Johnson might be just a sneaky guy, but 4,100 is might, might be a little bit too high. As for Gay, he's at 58. I also think that's too high. I love Jakob Pertl going back to the well. Now, he does have to take on Joel Embiid, so that's a struggle. But 5,100, I do like him. As for Embiid at 10-3, he dropped 81 last game against the Pacers. He should have a field day here. So he looks to be a massively strong option. Al Horford and Drew Eubanks, they're not going to get it done for me. The last game we look at is the Lakers and the Jazz. LeBron and Davis, Kuzma and Royce O'Neal all appear in the injury report as probable. I like Mike Conley at 5,500. Should get to that number, assuming it's not a blowout, while Don Mitchell's at $7,000. He's done. He's good. He's had some struggles, and Jordan Clarkson's been a little bit up and down. I think they're both tournament guys we want to look at here, while LeBron at 10-7, even though he hasn't been at his best, he's still giving us 40-plus. So I think that's okay. It's not massive, but I think it's okay. Shooting guard, Dion Waiters, love that as a low-priced guy. He's a 20-point guy most nights, and at 3,200, he's really an option for me here. More than Danny Green, and Joe Ingles at 55 is probably a little bit too much. For your small forwards, you look at the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma at 4,400, playing really well. No reason to think he can't be a 25-point guy here, so I think that he is an option. And then for your bigs, Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee, not keen there against Gobert. As for Gobert at 7,100. Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. It's probably a little bit too high for Gobert. Davis at 9-8, again, struggling somewhat, but I think he's still in play for tournaments and cash. JaVale and Tony Bradley, no thank you. All right, let's take a look at some pricing now on FanDuel. I like DeJounte. I like the Holiday Boys over there. I like Thomas Bryant. Um... I like Miles Turner, Troy Brown, Derek White, uh, Conley, Simmons, Geordie Clarkson, uh, Lonnie Walker, Don Mitchell, Brandon Ingram, Joel B, Toby Harris, Jokic, and I think Jimmy Butler comes in as a pretty good option in that Toronto game. Over on FanDuel, guys, that'll do it for me today. Don't forget, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.